and welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your resident everyman, Sam Schultz, and joining me this week, as always, my steadfast friend, Sari Riley. I'm your friend. Oh, I <laughs> being your friend is lower pressure okay, than being the okay, science you're expert. Too much I love into it. This. I love it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you're too much into this. <laughs> And as you can see, if you're watching this, which you can, youtube.com slash tangents, Hank is not here, which can only mean one thing, Deboki is here. Yes, today we are joined by Journey to the Microcosmos writer and narrator, podcast host, and not to mention Tangents editorial assistant, Deboki Chakravarti. Hi, Deboki. Hello. I'm excited to be What's here. What's your podcast called? T- Tell us. It's called Tiny Matters. You can find it wherever okay. you find your podcasts. And then you haven't, do you have another podcast? You've done other podcasting projects. Yes. Yeah. In the past, I've done other podcasting projects, but Tiny Matters is my current ongoing one with the wonderful Sam Jones. And uh, yeah, that's, that's been a lot of fun. So if you guys want to hear fun science stories about weird small things and how even those tiny things are super, super important, uh, look for Tiny Matters. Deboki's a great follow. She's always <laughs> making content. Yeah. She's a content factory. <laughs> I've never really thought of myself as a content factory, but <laughs> I sure I am now. As one. <laughs> That's good to know. Now I'm going to do my best Hank impersonation, and I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to start with a very long prelude in which I say this. I'm building a patio in my backyard, and I have to big a, dig a big hole to do it. And as I'm digging this hole, I'm thinking, it's a very small hole. And I'm thinking, I'm like destroying the environment. Just feels weird. There's like bugs crawling around and there's like rocks and like st- like things you're pulling out of the ground. It feels feels weird. So my question for both of you is, all right, have you ever dug a really good hole before? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Man, if we were serial killers, this would be a really awkward question. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh-oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a yeah. trap for you to vote. <laughs> Out there in the Massachusetts woods. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in the house I grew up in, the people who owned it before us had an above ground pool. And immediately when we moved in, we took it out because my dad was like, it's a death trap. The The stand that they used to get into it had a, was already splintering. And so we just had the sand pit in our backyard. Okay. And I played in that so much and so i definitely at one point buried some money in there that i then dug up later uh and i'm pretty sure i just tried to dig to the bottom of it like just trying to find what's underneath all this sand Uh um and i found a lot of cat poop and a lot of nothing that's what i was gonna say yeah (laughs) imagine you were playing in it and cats are pooping in it yep exactly so it's still a death trap in my backyard. Deboki, surely you've had time to think of a big... A I mean, I sure tried dug. to think of one, but I can't think of that. Like, all the, the holes I think of I like are, like, conversational holes. Um, oh. I, and those are good. Those are not good holes to dig yourself into. The only hole I can think of is, like, from high school. My freshman year, we had some kind of archaeology project where we were given some sort of ancient civilization. We had to come up with artifacts, bury them, mm. and then uh, dig up somebody else's hole that they had made. And I don't know if this was the group that we dug up or if I'm just, like, see remembering something that someone else dealt with, and I decided that this was the hole that we had to dug up. But we dug up some hole where basically that group had decided that they were going to bury a bunch of concrete bricks first. So we were like, we were like in at the top of this hill in our, in our uh, school trying to dig up a hole. And we, we first had to uncover concrete bricks before we actually got to the artifacts we were supposed to be discovering. What the heck? Were you just digging holes in the regular? Well, we knew where we were supposed to go. Like they were marked off. (laughs) They told us. Plus it was pretty clear where (laughs) other class, like other groups had buried their generations of holes had been dug. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Weird. Cool. That, that sounds is really fun. cool. Okay. Well, this is a podcast, and this is how you introduce the podcast. Every week on Tangents, we get together <laughs> and try to one up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory, and this week for Deboki Bucks. Or is there a funner word for him? Boke Bucks. Yeah, please. Boke Bucks. 
Boke Bucks, excuse me. <laughs> Boke Bucks, which Deboki will be awarding to us as we play. And at the end of the episode, either Sari or I will be crowned the winner. And for the whole month of July, we will be celebrating the childlike wonder present in science with a bunch of topics inspired by the sort of junk the kids like. Like dinosaurs, not to spoil the episode. Like spaceships, like play, which was our last episode. Stuff like that. We're calling it Kids Month, but that does not mean that you should watch Tangents or listen to Tangents with your kids. Because we're still going to swear. We're still going to talk about probably poop. And I guess kids like poop, but we'll call it shit and kids can't hear that. Sari loves to say shit. That's me. But the scientific you... name for poop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but something you can enjoy with your kids is our sister show, SciShow Kids. Uh, which is a YouTube channel. It's like SciShow, but for early elementary learners. And it's hosted by Jesse Knudsen Castaneda, who you might know from the channel Animal Wonders, and Anthony Brown, and Squeaks, who's this little robot rat puppet. He's not, a, if you're a kid and listening to this, he's real. He's not a puppet. Uh, so go check it out if you have kids in your life. But now, as always, we introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week from Sari. When I was young in days of yore, a nerdy and precocious child, I did not care about <laughs> dinosaurs, ancient beasts, fearsome or mild. I liked to look at spittle bugs or leaves and dirt and sand and sea. Dinos were dead, so what? Big shrug. There was plenty of earth in front of me. So I didn't learn their names at all. No stegosaur or old T-Rex. Just Yoshi and some fireballs or myths of dragons when I wanted to flex. I see their appeal, don't get me wrong. All gruesome teeth and nests of eggs. Reptiles and birds combined so strong with colorful feathers or tree trunk legs. The magic to me, though, deep in my heart is how I love things different from you. For some, it's code or abstract art, growing flowers or making stew. So if dinosaurs are your thing, let's go. And if not, don't worry, we'll learn something fun. Because really, there's so much to know. And our journey with science will never be done. You couldn't even pretend in a poem that you liked dinosaurs. No way! <laughs> Sarah, I've be... never related to you more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, start out this episode on dinosaurs being like, eh, who cares about them? <laughs> Devoki, you don't like dinosaurs either? I just did not grow up a dinosaur kid. They just, yeah. I, I think they were cool. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I have strong memories of, uh, like, doing an, a, a diorama about the iguanodon, I think, in second mm -hmm. grade. And that was, like, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but they just weren't my jam. I don't know. That's understand. It's hard to grow up in Montana and not be a dinosaur kid. Fair. Because we have tons of museums and yeah. bones everywhere. We love, is it Myasauruses, I think, is like our state dinosaur. Oh, so. interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Were you a dinosaur like kid then? I was a Godzilla kid. <laughs> <laughs> which, while not strictly a dinosaur, yeah. pretty dinosaur adjacent. <laughs> no, not really. I... I yeah, I actually didn't really care about them either. I know I had like dinosaur mm -hmm. toys and stuff, but I don't remember like pouring over books of it. I didn't like any smart stuff when I was a kid. So I wasn't reading any books that could actually teach me anything. I was playing Mario and riding around on Yoshi. Well, anyway, so as you probably guessed because we said it a million times, this week's topic is dinosaurs and Sari. What is a dinosaur? So this is something that I've also gone a lot of my professional life not exactly knowing. <laughs> this is a this is a useful episode for me too, um, because the the popular conception of dinosaur or like what I've carried with me through pop culture is that it's any sort of like big extinct reptile like animal, and then there's mm -hmm. a group of people that are like, well, birds are dinosaurs too, and I always was like, eh, that must be a loophole. Whatever, I'm going to not think about it for more than three seconds. <laughs> you got a real chip on your shoulder. <laughs> I think I'm playing it up a little bit for the episode, but really, like space, kind of. I just haven't been yeah. a, I'm not a space person. I'm not really a dinosaur person. Um, you like all the boring science. Yeah. Small what, stuff. What was, your, what was your science? I think like plants and animals and things yeah. like that. Like I used to, I worked at a science museum and ran the touch tank mm -hmm. and that was really oh, cool. Yeah. But yeah. Outside, I would I like made a notebook for myself, and I would just go around our backyard and write down what I saw. Mm -hmm. So probably like zoology. Hey, we have an episode about that on SciShow Kids. Oh, I'll teach your kids how to do that. Well, I just did that by myself because I'm a big old nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a loophole, right? They are birds. Yeah, right? they are birds, and that's what's weird. Um, so it's like I I was reading a bunch of articles about this. If you took something like a crow 
and you took something like uh, from the late Triassic, uh, but we'll just use whatever dinosaur. If you take like a T-Rex and you take a crow, and then the ways in which they are evolutionary related, that creates like a circle, uh, like the clade of dinosauria. So Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily reptilian in nature, in fact, it's more like bird-like, vaguely reptile adjacent, but the the traits that they have in common are most often like the the stance of their hips and legs and how they are more straight down rather than splayed out like a crocodile or the fact that they lay eggs or um, different skin coatings, like whether it's scaled or feathered or things like that, but like some sort of tough keratinized coating. It, it, it is like an evolutionary grouping that extends from mil- hundreds of millions of years ago to the present day because birds are in this group of dinosaurs. But if you want to talk about extinct dinosaurs, then you should say non-avian dinosaurs, which is like mm-hmm. a handy way to exclude <laughs> birds. And then the like common ancestor where birds diverge from dinosaurs, which is like a very weird thing to wrap your head around because yeah. of... This pervasive narrative of dinosaurs as giant lizards or giant reptiles. Which is part of their name, right? Yeah. Getting to that, that <laughs> next part. Getting to that part, yeah. <laughs> uh, dinosaur comes from Greek dinos, which means terrible, powerful, or wondrous, and soros, which means lizard. And so like the earlier the earliest bones that were found by English speaking scientists rich white dudes mostly (laughs) they were like ah this looks like a lizard that we'd see nowadays but big um and so the first three specimens that were named were a megalosaurus which meant great lizard an iguanodon which comes from the word iguana plus don Mm -hmm. uh don like orthodontics tooth don is in tooth Mm -hmm. and then the hyliosaurus which means uh, of the forest lizard. So really we were like, okay, it's a big lizard, an iguana lizard, or like a, <laughs> has an iguana tooth, and then a forest lizard. And all these are kind of the same thing. So mm-hmm. we were very pro-lizard when it came to early dinosaurs. All right. Well, I think we know what dinosaurs are. Even if we don't care about them, we still know <laughs> what they are. And, and that means it's time to move on to the quiz portion of our show. And I will now hand the reins over to Deboki for almost the whole rest of the episode. (laughs) Deboki, what game are we playing? We are playing Truth or Fail Dinosaur Edition. So, you know, scientists, they find these fossils, they look at animals today, they do some comparisons, and they come up with stories about what might have happened. They come up with their theories, their hypotheses for what kind of life dinosaurs lived. So today, I have three tales for you of possible dinosaur behavior that scientists have devised based on their fossil findings. But only one of them is true. Which one is it? So story number one, scientists studying the texture of a Tyrannosaurus skull found that it contained many, many nerves that respond to tactile sensations, leading them to hypothesize that Tyrannosaurs have sensitive snouts that they use to kiss. Ooh. Oh, what? (laughs) Story number two. Scientists studying ankylosaur tracks noted their footprints were often followed by a distinct imprint of the tail's club into the ground, causing them to hypothesize that the dinosaur used its club tail like a walking stick to keep balance. And then story number three, paleontologists uncovered a cave in Patagonia that held more than 100 Mosaurus eggs surrounded by fossilized poop containing egg fragments, leading them to believe that the cave belonged to a mystery dinosaur that stockpiled young Mosaurus eggs for food. So to recap, we have fact number one, Tyrannosaurs had sensitive snouts for kissing. Fact number two, Ankylosaurs hiked around with their club tails as a walking stick. And fact number three, a mystery dinosaur species hoarded Mosaurus eggs for future snacks. Is an Ankylosaurus the, the the big guy, the turtle shell guy? Yeah. Why would they need a walking stick? They got four legs. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to be a big dinosaur, you know? You got to figure out your yeah. balance. You don't want to flip over. For sure. Because once They're you quite... flip over as a big guy, then 
I feel like that's it for you. R.I.P. Yeah, quite low to the ground. I feel like you know the answer to this, Harry. Um, I or don't. Or you're just jumping to Deboki's defense. I'm for just. No reason. You guys got an egghead kinship that I don't really appreciate <laughs> that much. Have I been saying but, ankylosaurus or ankylosaurus? I've always said ankylosaurus, but that's probably from a cartoon that I saw. So I don't know. <laughs> T. Rexes. Did they like each other? They had to like each other sometimes yeah. to have babies, I guess. Everyone's yeah. Every animal's got to like another animal at some point. I feel like this would be kind of cute. You can't high five them. They can't hold hands, so <laughs> they got to smooch. Do other animals do anything like that? I guess like I don't know. birds do pair up and they must they must be affectionate with each other somehow, I would In imagine. Some way. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't, that's the other thing. I haven't spent very much time around birds, so I, they're mysteries <laughs> yeah. to me too. Hmm. Okay, but what about egg snacks? Would you... St- <laughs> I was gonna say, would you store yeah. eggs as snacks? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, now would a dinosaur? Could be based, this one could be based on the fact that people have eggs in their refrigerator. <laughs> now that I think about it. I opened up my fridge and wrote a fact. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. You were like panicking about yeah. it last night in the middle of the night. Yeah. And you were like, ah, oh, stressy. <laughs> Open your fridge. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, I bet that's true. <laughs> I don't think that one's real. I don't think that one's real. That that one just ah, stockpiling. I don't know. Do, I don't feel like I've heard of a lot of animals that stockpile things that aren't nuts. You know, hmm. Hmm. an egg's good, bad. But if they're not, if you're eating them with like baby yeah. and all, then you hmm. you can keep them for as long as it takes to incubate, which could be months. That's a good food source. A little yeah. protein in there. I feel like of all of these, and this is not the way that I like to do this, but the one that I feel like you couldn't make up or like that you wouldn't make up is the walking stick one. Hmm. That one's just too weird. So I feel like I'm going to go with that one, even though I can't figure it out in my head. That makes it maybe more likely to me. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Maybe they're like walking sideways and they're like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I was caught between the, the kissing T-Rexes and the egg snacks, so I was hoping you'd choose one of those so I could choose the other one. But <laughs> I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with the T-Rexes kissing because that seems like the most fun. Yeah. Uh it definitely is the most fun. It's also the most correct. Oh no. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, in 2017, some researchers, they were studying this Tyrannosaurus uh, skull. It belonged to Despletosaurus hornieri, uh, which is a member of the Tyrannosaurus family. It's smaller than a T-Rex, but still pretty big. Its skull is about a meter in length. And so they wanted to see how the skull's skeletal texture compared to crocodiles and birds and figure out, you know, how do the tissues compare? How do the scales compare? And so on top of finding evidence for certain, t- like, textures of skin and horn structures and flat scales. They also found that the skull had a lot of openings for a type of nerve called the trigeminal nerve, which relays the sensation of touch on the snout back to the brain. And so the number of openings they found was actually really similar to that of crocodiles, which are really sensitive to, you know, things touching their snout as well. And one of the things that crocodiles do apparently is they have a very elaborate courtship experience including uh from when i was looking it up they like will like rub jaws and stuff and so that's they kiss each other too yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) i mean i don't know if they think of it that way but it probably sure looks look like it in a very weird Uh crocodilian kind of situation um so that's why the researchers hypothesized that hey maybe these t-rexes they had you know like sarah said they or i think it was sarah like they can't hold hands you know maybe Mm -hmm. i mean i don't know if that's why they would do it but (laughs) maybe neither can any other animal an otter like, can uh, they link up they're like yeah, that's true. Mm, i'm yeah. hanging out I'm the whole that's hand. true us otters and like monkeys and apes that's it <laughs> yeah nothing else can hold hands so that doesn't seem like a really very good reason to me but but i think when right, you link so. that up with the fact that they do have very sensitive nerves in their face or they have a lot of sensitivity right. in their face because of these nerves that that could suggest that maybe this is part of their behavior so there there were other reasons you know maybe this is also a way for them to detect prey all of that stuff but i think the best reason the best possible reason is the t-rex kissing well, um, good for them. Yeah. So then um, are the other stories um, that are based on things that were almost there, but not really. So for the Ankylosaurus, I was looking at the study of a Struthiosaurus astriacus uh, fossil from Austria, which is, I believe, a 
specific uh, species of Ankylosaurus. And the researchers were looking at the brain case of the dinosaur, and they found that it had these like small regions that were usually, you know, in, in brains, they're associated with things like fixing your eyes when you move your head around, also things like parts of the inner ear, which help us with audition and with balance. And they found that these areas in this particular species were really small, so it probably couldn't hear very well, and also it probably moved pretty hmm. slowly. And so in that case, the researchers hypothesized that maybe this particular species um, would have preferred a more solitary lifestyle just because it couldn't you know, engage in these particular ways. Uh, huh. So that was the inspiration for that. I would love it if it did use its club tail as a walking stick, but... Just no can't. evidence. That he I has four think. legs. <laughs> but, <laughs> but imagine if you could just like stake a, your tail down onto the ground and you would just not have to worry about falling over. Or like if you need to round a corner really fast, you yeah. just stick it down and then You could grab it around. Exactly. and yeah. just spin yeah. yourself around. I think we've, 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 That's what you should have said. We really <laughs> <laughs> innovated on nature Yeah, is what we've yeah. done. We if we had a club use. tail, this is what we would do. Please, evolution, <laughs> yes. just like give an adaptation. I'm ready for my tailbone to come back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Vestigial no more. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last story, the egg story, is not, the, as far as I could tell, I, I did not find a story about dinosaur stockpiling eggs. But I did find this really cool study about uh, Mosaurus patagonicus, uh, which is this early Jurassic plant-eating dinosaur. And in 2013, researchers had found a bunch of their eggs and fossils in southern Patagonia. And one of the things that they found is that these fossils and these eggs were distributed by, by age. So like the younger dinosaurs mm. and the eggs were kind of in one area. So and like as you got older, like there were these groups of juveniles whose fossils were grouped together. And then the older, like the adult dinosaurs were kind of off on their own or in pairs. And so they hypothesized based on this that this dinosaur was living in this surprisingly complex social structure within its herd where there's like a nesting site where these younger dinosaurs are then there are these schools of young mosauruses and then the adults are like going off and doing things for the herd they had kindergarten yeah yeah exactly uh, like kids tables like yeah. okay kids eat your dinner <laughs> yeah. brought yeah. it back for you exactly <laughs> ah well okay we all learned something here today yep and uh we i came away from it not very good with zero <laughs> points and Sari has one point and now it's time to take a short break and then it will be time for the fact off and we're back and now it is time for the fact off where Sari and I have brought science facts to present to Deboki in an attempt to blow her mind. Uh, after we've presented our facts, Deboki will then judge them and award us bulk bucks any way that she sees fit. But before that, Deboki, do you have a trivia question for us to decide who goes first? I sure do. Sauropods were giant, long-necked, plant-eating dinosaurs that could grow to 150 feet in length and 70 tons in weight. In 2012, an exhibition on the world's largest dinosaur at the American Museum of Natural History featured one of the smaller sauropods called Mamonchisaurus. Mamonchisaurus. Who's naming these things? <laughs> I don't know. Huh? I really should have looked up a lot more pronunciations. I very much <laughs> overestimated myself. <laughs> this sauropod was about 60 feet long and about 13 tons in weight. So that's about 26,000 pounds or 11,793 kilograms. So how many pounds of plant life did this particular sauropod likely consume in a single day? Oh, I hate questions like this because I'm going to say something so stupid and everyone's going to laugh at me. <laughs> no, nobody really knows. <laughs> that's no why I love like questions that. like this. Mm hmm. Here's my logic that's also based on nothing, but I just I just string it together so but I But everyone smart. will be like, Sari's so, ah, so wise. She went to MIT. <laughs> yeah. So she must kind of know what she's talking about. Okay. I think they got a big mouth. I think each chomp of a leaf is like 
half a pound of leaves. So really, it's how many chomps they could get in in a given day. <laughs> oh, okay. This is not nice. the logic I was expecting. I'm really enjoying this. Oh, yeah. This is how I arbitrarily do it in my head all the time. Uh, so like, let's say you bite some leaves. So two bites is one pound. Let's say you buy, I think it's like 150 pounds. I could see them taking 300 bites. Gold? Mm -hmm. Are you accounting for their chewing? No, just like, just the initial chomp. They probably more jaw movements across a whole day and like walking around, finding more leaves. But I think they get in their leaf collection bites, get around 150 pounds. Okay. Sam. I'm doing some math. <laughs> uh, how many minutes are in a day? Oh my gosh. <laughs> what did you say again, Sarah? 150 pounds. I'm going to say 151 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite logic. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, your logic is you think that Sari is underestimating. I think she's lowballing it. Yeah. yeah. Well, she is, in fact, massively lowballing it. Oh, no. The correct answer is wow. 1,150 pounds of plant life. Oh, oh, look who doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's me. But I was, I I was very like fascinated it. by the, the use of chewing as a possible way to figure out like to, as the source of your logic because this is actually like a really fascinating part of trying to understand how they could live because mm -hmm. they got to eat a lot of food in a single day so the thing is that apparently they did not bother with chewing they didn't really have oh. much in the oh. way of teeth or strong jaws they really kind of just had incisors in the front of their mouth which they used to like cut up the plants and get it into their mouth but really they're just relying on their gastric juices to take care of everything from there and so one of the interesting things is that this also made their head relatively light given how big they are because huh. they're just like their focus is just getting the food in um, rather than like chomping and eating everything right away. So the, Do you know it, if that's common or did every did most leaf eating guys do that or I don't know if how many of them did that because I think hmm. this is probably like part of their evolution and part of how they were able to get to a certain st size. Yeah. But I don't know to what extent that necessarily was widespread around other dinosaurs. So, yeah. Mm. So Sam, Sam was the winner by <laughs> one <laughs> less <laughs> than Sari. So, uh, so Sam can decide who goes first. I think I, I think I'll just go first. The Tyrannosaurus Rex a 20-foot-tall, bloodthirsty killing machine. Its giant jaws capable of delivering almost 12,800 pounds of force, making it potentially the hardest-biting land animal of all time, built for carnage. The chicken, around about a foot and a half tall, sort of grumpy little guys. Their beaks are capable of delivering quite the little pinch. Built to walk around, eat some bugs, and get deep-fried. Surely there's no way these two animals are related, right? Eh, wrong. The <laughs> test done in 2008 on molecules of collagen recovered from T-Rex fossils, the mighty beast was found to be most closely related to the humble chicken, uh, which is, you know, not really ideal for T-Rexes who used to basically rule the earth, but it's kind of awesome for us because dinosaurs aren't alive anymore. So identifying animals that are closely related to them can give us insight into how they might have lived and moved uh, when they weren't just a big pile of bones in the ground. And we have looked at birds to make these inferences, but in 2014, a team of researchers sort of took umbrage with the comparisons due to one key difference between chickens and a lot of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, like T-Rexes, have a big old tail, and chickens don't. And they pointed out a big old tail would change an animal's center of balance substantially in ways that could entirely change how the animal walks. So they did the obvious thing. They stuck a contraption made of clay, Velcro, and a big old stick onto a chicken's ass to mimic a tail. So they took and they hatched a bunch of chicks, and then they raised them, uh, outfitting them as they grew with a series of fake tails that matched how big they were. Uh, and they increased it in size as the chickens grew. And what they ended up with was a whole bunch of chickens that did not walk like normal chickens. So modern birds tend to have like a really crouched stance and they power their walk with their knees. But these T-Rex tail chickens did things differently. They powered their steps with their hips and they also stood quite a bit taller than a regular chicken. And honestly, they sort of looked cooler than a normal chicken, <laughs> uh, befitting of their dinosaur roots. They kind of look like a corn dog with a chicken on it. 
I didn't realize chickens use their neck this much to walk. Like, I've never uh-huh. watched a chicken really oh. just... Whoa. I feel like I've looked at a lot of chickens yeah. in my life, and I've never really noticed that either. Mm-hmm. Very neck-centric fellows. Yeah. yeah. And it's subtle, but once you notice, like, how much cooler the T-Rex chickens are walking, <laughs> it's like, all right. I mean, it could just be the tail. I can see. Well, it's all the tail. That's what balances them out. That gives them a yeah. cool yeah. balance. And it's just a nice accessory. But, as always, we gotta ask... Uh, why the hell did they do this? And I think the answer partially is there's just a lot of people out there who really want to know how dinosaurs walked around. <laughs> and uh, what the researchers pointed out in this study is that the experimental chickens actually ended up walking more like a mammal than a modern bird, which means that looking at how birds walk is probably not the best way to figure out how dinosaurs walked, uh, which is information that we'll probably use to build a robot or something. I don't really know. Did they say anything about whether or not the chickens like liked having a tail? <laughs> I don't think they really noticed that they did. Okay. It didn't seem to imply that any of them had a problem with it. And they were otherwise like fine, like they didn't have to worry about like does their tail make it harder for them to poop? Is it like fitted <laughs> inappropriately? I would assume so. They they made special custom tails for each one. Yeah. Uh so I would imagine that they cut a pooper <laughs> into each one but i actually don't really know where chickens poop from so they're cloaca right but, but they wore it forever and they yeah. got and they grew up so they weren't just holding it in that was very fascinating and i will always think of that video now uh sari <laughs> what is your fact so like we've talked about one of the trickiest things about studying animals that have been dead for hundreds of millions of years is that we have to make so many guesses from fossils or comparisons to modern creatures. No wonder that Deboki and I have the same opinion about dinosaurs and what's cool about them is that we have to make guesses. Uh, I just thought that's very funny. We wrote the same introductions to our things. Um, But we also have the power of math to help us. Specifically, computer models let us simulate the physics of things like bones and muscles and see what movements might have been possible for different dinosaurs. For example, sauropods, like we just talked about, are those huge herbivorous dinosaurs like Tropius and Pokemon or an Apatosaurus in the late Jurassic period. <laughs> oh, wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, it's Tropius. You know, you could, you know what it looks like, Sam. It's uh, Ruby and <laughs> Sapphire. Okay, I'll look him up while you continue. Uh, and we've made assumptions that they use their long necks for things like reaching thousands of pounds of tasty leaves or seeming sexy to mates. But what about their just as long tails? Modern day animals use tails for things from communication and balance to self-defense and temperature control. And just looking at fossils, paleontologists had guessed that sauropods use their tails as sweeping weapons to fend off foes, whether they were thin and whip-like or had a club at the end. And many sauropod tailbones are forked in a way that could have protected nerves and blood vessels as the tail flesh flailed around. Like forked at the end? Uh, Like forked along it. Oh, So like the vertebra themselves were forked Hmm. so that the nerves and blood vessels could be nestled inside like a protective little cave Mm -hmm. um, as they ran down to provide like blood to the tail Mm -hmm. flesh. And in 1997, a computer scientist teamed up with a paleontologist to model the thin whip-like tail of an Apatosaurus louisi and learned that it could hold up to the stress of being flung around just like a bullwhip, even so fast that the tip could reach the speed of sound. Uh, and they calculated that the collision of that high-speed tail whip would have caused just as much damage to the tail as anything it hit, so it probably wasn't being used as a weapon, and Hmm. instead hypothesized that the tail was another way to attract mates by making a loud, possibly even a supersonic noise, whether it was whipped through the air or smacked against water or some other way to, like, make a loud noise. And not to poke holes in my own fact off, but I gotta be (laughs) honest here. In 2002, a paper was published talking about the physics of bullwhips and supersonic cracks. And it found that the looping shape of a cracking whip is what causes the sound. So like that, the bending motion of the whip Mm -hmm. is what matters as opposed to just the sheer speed at the tip of the whip. So the tip 
of a whipping bullwhip that makes a crack is actually going quite faster than the speed of sound. And it's that loop that needs to be at the speed of sound. Hmm. And I don't think they calculated that in this computer model uh, (laughs) of an apatosaurus tail. Um, And anyway, it's just speculation. But mostly, I just think it's cool that humans have basically been dinosaur nerds and writing the scientific equivalent of dinosaur fan fiction and imagining what kinds of sounds they make (laughs) (laughs) and things that they do to woo each other since we've discovered fossils interesting Mm, not real though sorry (laughs) Uh, maybe they did model it they modeled it for real but i don't know if it actually makes a big cracking noise i think that's why the latest news on this was 1997 (laughs) So this was, you said this paper came out after the bullwhip, the other one, the like the physics? Before. Before, so okay. this So the, the Apatosaurus tail paper came out in 1997, okay. and the bullwhip paper came out in 2002. So I think they were completely separate. Yeah. Like in 2002, that group was just interested in the physics of whips. Yeah. But I remembered it independently <laughs> of this and was like, ah, damn, I got to look it up <laughs> to tell my fact truthfully. And yes. then it contradicted it. And I was like, well... Too late to change now. Wait, I, you did that research yourself? Yeah. You could like publish a paper now, debunking. <laughs> Is that how it works? I guess so, yeah. I could write a critique of it. Yeah. I haven't published in academia in years. But, At the very uh, least, you can publish this podcast. It's yeah, the same yeah. thing. <laughs> That's exact same thing in this language at all. Peer reviewed podcast. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> we are the reviewers. <laughs> we have said, we've agreed, Sari. You're correct. Yeah. Well, I will say that for today. I do love a good fact check, but I do have to give it to the chicken tails. <laughs> I, I just, I will never forget watching chickens with fake tails across them. This video entitled Chicken Walking Like a Dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Which means that thanks, Sam gets a point. The rare book book. Yes, yes. <laughs> and we're tied, right? Yeah, so you oh, guys should- are tied one book book to one book book. Oh. I don't know how Hank does this, but I think you just get to decide who wins now. Yeah, oh. so you got to decide if Sam's chicken fact was more impressive, like overall. Oh. If you were just you could so give me a hundred book books. Yeah, you could give. Okay. I mean, I have to say, but if that it's only I- worth one, then we can talk. Yeah. So I always think whenever I write any torf that they are deeply easy to figure out which one is the truth because I always think of myself as terrible at lying and I rely <laughs> heavily on Hank to sell the lies, which he is very good at. So I I would I would have to give maybe I'll maybe I'll give two book books. I'm not gonna give a hundred to one, but I'll give two book books to Sam's chicken tails. Because again, the chicken. Because tails. you have bad self esteem, is that yes, because I, I don't believe in myself. <laughs> Though I, I, I'm tempted to also give Siri a point for not talking herself out of the correct fact. That's no, what's no, so no. hard. Too granular. Too granular. We can't get into that. Let's move on to the science. Yeah, you got to be kinder to yourself. Okay. Be proud of your torf, Devoki. <laughs> no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with Sam gets two and Sari gets one. Oh, that means it's time to ask the science couch, where we ask a science question from our audience to our finely honed couch of scientific minds. Quill on Discord asks, why do species names keep changing? Which Mm. I guess is in reference to brontosauruses. Mm. Are they real anymore? Are they not real anymore? Apatosauruses, is that the same thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think in general, species names are changing all the time across biology. Maybe not. For everything that's not even just dinosaurs. Not even just dinosaurs. Yeah. Not not like the big ones. Like a lot of the the mammals, because there are so few mammals relative to everything else. We kind of got those wired in. We got them locked down. People are pretty easy to look at a mammal and be like, that's a skunk. That's Mm -hmm. a bear. That's a chipmunk. Yeah, but once you start right? getting into like beetles or like invertebrates, yeah. other yeah. other kinds of invertebrates that are all kind of blobby, you're like that beetle is slightly less green than this other beetle. Uh huh. I don't know what that means. Yep. Then it's harder to sort out the evolutionary relationships or right. know if one species has actually been discovered a long time ago and had a different name, and so like by principle, the person who named it first, like that name, should carry through. So the the story behind Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus is that Brontosaurus was first named in 1879 um, by Char- uh, Charles Marsh as of the Bone Wars fame. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of the one of the guys who yelled a lot and was rude and stole a lot of fossils and crushed his rivals' fossils and stuff like that. He was like, I found an animal, it's a brontosaurus, sure. And then nineteen oh three, another paleontologist named Elmer Riggs, like after finding more fossils, thought that Brontosaurus was actually a species of Apatosaurus. Like Apatosaurus was the genus level. That's the the those are the fossils that had the common traits and what was found as a brontosaurus fossil was actually just a subset of those traits. Um, mm. Instead of calling it a brontosaurus, then it was um, an apatosaurus excelsius. And so they were like, only apatosauruses exist. Brontosauruses don't, except for like this thing. I guess mm. brontosaurus could be a common name for an apatosaurus excelsius. But then more recently, it's gone back and forth, but I think like in the 2015s is the latest paper where there are enough fossils found that Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus are now both considered genuses of dinosaurs with different species. So like there are, there are enough separate characteristics of them, whether it's like the longness of their necks or the girthiness of their hips or whatever, to say that they're slightly more separate and not one species like nested under another. Um, so they're both real and that's, that's Great. that. That's like the, <laughs> yeah. what a nice ending yeah. for everyone. <laughs> well, if you want to ask the science couch ear question, follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out the topics for upcoming episodes every week or join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our discord. Thank you to at Ryan Laser, at what Ethan loves and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. Deboki, thank you so much for being here. We talked at the top of the show about where we can find you. Anything else you want to plug at the end here? I mean, I just, I remembered halfway through the episode that one of our, fir- oh. our first episode of Tiny Matters was about dinosaurs. So you should check that oh. out uh, after, after huge, listening though. to this. What the heck? <laughs> yeah, but they have small bits of them that are very important for reasons we get it to. If you like the show and you want to help us out, it's real easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash tangents to become a patron and get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes. We're going to do a live stream bonus episode that happened a couple weeks ago at this point. Who knows if it even worked, but hopefully it did and we had a lot of fun. Second, leave us a review wherever you listen. It's super helpful. It helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell tell people people about about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I have been Sam Schultz. I've been Sari Riley. And I'm Deboki Chakravarti. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by me, Sam Schultz. Our editor is Seth Glixman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Paola Garcia-Prieto. Our editorial assistants are Deboki Chakravarti and Emma Douster. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and Hank Green. We couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. Around 230 million years ago, a dinosaur relative called Ciliosaurus opalensis took a poop that became a fossilized coprolite. Modern day scientists analyzed this poop rock using synchrotron microtomography and found lots of tiny, almost perfectly preserved beetle carcasses, along with some fibers that could be fungi or algae. This tiny beetle is the first insect species to be described from a coprolite. So they named it Triamixa coprolithica after its poopy grave. Uh, would it be embarrassing or cool to have like to know that some scientist was looking at a poop that you took a long time ago? That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, I would want to have eaten something cool though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there things you would not want them to find in your poop? It would be like, oh, this person swallowed their gum a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>